Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the sixth chapter in my series on the selected gross pathology of the nervous system, in which we're going to talk about some nutritional, metabolic, and toxic diseases. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the last 30 years have provided me fantastic images which allow me to put these lectures together. And I sincerely hope that these lectures do justice to their knowledge and their sharing of these images. First, we're going to start with nutritional and metabolic diseases. And we'll start off with an important disease that looks very different in carnivores as it does in herbivores. And that's thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency. This condition was first identified in carnivores in foxes in 1942 on a fur farm owned by a farmer named Chazdek. And the disease for many years bore his name. Chastex paralysis. We don't hear that name much anymore and we certainly don't want to glorify someone who made their living making fur. So we just call it thiamine deficiency encephalopathy in the dog and the cat. It's not seen that much in the dog anymore but you can still see it in cats, particularly in cats who've been starving. And there was a very nice re recent paper in VetPath about two cats from Canada who, uh, who had been neglected, starved, and had concomitant lesions of severe hepatic lipidosis and thiamine deficiency in encephalopathy. Now, this is a great older picture of the condition in a dog which shows the very particular spots that are most often hit by this deficiency. The lesion is hemorrhage and necrosis. It's thought to be due to a vasculitis induced by the thiamine deficiency in very specific areas of the brain. From the back, there's necrosis and hemorrhage within the caudal colliculi progressing to the periventricular nuclei, including the red nucleus, and then ultimately terminating in the lateral geniculate nuclei. It's a classic progression along nerves of the auditory cortex, but the symptoms and the disease reflect a much more widespread disease in the brain. There are probably a lot of neurons undergoing degeneration that don't show up at this point in the, life, the, the time span of the lesion. It's a nutritional disease. Obviously, cats get it from starving. Uh, other carnivores get it from either uh, heating the food and inactivating thiamine, or as this has been seen on uh, fur farms over the years, feeding poor quality diets with uh, certain types of fish which contain enzymes that break down the thiamine in the diet. Thiamine does a lot of things in the body but in the central nervous system um, it is a required component of transketolase in the Krebs cycle and in deficient states you will see decreased levels of transketolase, which has been shown in rats with induced thiamine deficiency, and you'll see increased amounts of pyruvate, the step right before that in the Krebs cycle. You can actually even measure elevated levels of pyruvate in animals with thiamine deficiency. This interruption of the Krebs cycle, inability to maintain energy balance, is thought to be the cause of the damage to endothelial cells resulting in vascular lesions and ultimately neurons within the brain. The first lesion that you see in the affected areas is vacuolation of neurons before you see the vascular lesion resulting in very specific hemorrhage and necrosis. In severe cases, you can also see necrosis in other areas, including the middle lamina of the temporal and occipital cortices. However, this triad of lesions, the caudal colliculi, the paraventricular nuclei, and the lateral geniculate nuclei are considered absolutely characteristic for this condition 
in carnivores. In herbivores or ruminants, it's a very different lesion. Grossly, you will see a initially a marked deepening and widening of the sulci in the brain, and you might actually see large divots or depressions within severely affected areas of the brain. You can tell that there's necrosis going on here because the breakdown of the myelin in these areas is turning the brain sort of a yellowish color. Now, this is not primarily a myelin disease. This is a disease that affects the superficial gray matter, the submeningeal gray matter of the neocortex in a very laminar fashion. You'll hear the term laminar cortical necrosis as applied to the condition of polioencephalomalacia in ruminants. Now, thiamine deficiency is only one of three major causes of this, also to include lead toxicity as well as excessive levels of sulfur in the diet. They all cause a very similar lesion of laminar cortical necrosis within the cerebrum. Remember, in carnivores, it left the cerebrum pretty much alone and it mostly hit the basal nuclei. Here in ruminants, the lesion is associated with a disease of the superficial parts of the cortex. It is often a fairly subtle lesion, and this is a great image of one, and you can see that the necrosis and hemorrhage is, is associated with the gray matter. The white matter is spared in this condition. Sometimes you can see a loss of thickness of the overlying gray matter. Sometimes you can see areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Sometimes it's very difficult to pick up at all and the lesions may be very subtle in the uh, under the microscope as well. This condition pops up a lot in the Wednesday slide conference. There's a wide variation in lesion severity and uh, sometimes it can be very difficult to pick up. We've talked about predisposing factors in carnivores being uh, a fish containing diet or heated food or starvation. It's probably a little different uh, in ruminants uh, as well because the bacterial flora generally in the rumen will produce thiamine. In ruminants, uh, you can have uh, a change in that bacterial flora, which might be seen in association with high levels of carbohydrates, um, to shift to a population of bacteria that not only don't produce thiamine, but may produce thiaminase and split the thiamine that is produced by the good bacteria. There are also some thiaminase containing plants such as bracken fern or horsetails and as we said before the the ingestion of a lot of sulfur in the diet uh, in itself may cause the polioencephalo polioencephalomalacia or may cause a acquired thiamine deficiency now the cool thing about this particular lesion in ruminants is that under the woods lamp the breakdown of the tissue will result in fluorescence this is commonly used in various certification examinations where they give you a picture of the brain of a cow or a sheep uh, that has polioencephalomalacia and it's fluorescing so make sure that uh, uh, you're familiar with this particular and very specific reaction in the brain of ruminants with thiamine deficiency. Now, there is a condition that grossly and histologically will look very much like polioencephalomalacia that affects the cerebrum of cattle. And I should have covered this in the section on viruses, and that's my bad, but I'm gonna cover it now. 
in young cattle in South America, especially Brazil and Argentina, bovine herpes virus type 5 is a cause of necrotizing encephalitis in young cattle. It's usually seen in animals up to 2 age, but may be seen in animals up to 6 months of age. More Morbidity is fairly low and less than 30% in a naive population, but mortality of those animals uh, reaches 100%. Uh, the lesions are, are similar to what you would see with polio and cephalomalacia, including blindness, uh, deep depression, uh, opisthotness. Uh, the lesion is a spectacular necrotizing encephalitis, and you can find the inclusion bodies within a variety of cells, including neurons and glial cells. To my knowledge, it's not seen in the U.S. It is seen in several countries in South America, and I apologize to the fantastic pathologists in Argentina and Brazil for overlooking this very important disease in their countries. And it's a great rule out for polio and cephalomalacia. Here's a classic lesion that is seen in turkeys to a lesser extent in other forms of poultry and uh, is associated with dietary vitamin E deficiency. There is marked hemorrhage and necrosis within the cerebellum resulting in a swollen cerebellum. Some people have referred to this as the Bing Cherry Cerebellum. The disease goes by a number of names including uh, encephalomalacia or crazy chick disease. In birds, vitamin E deficiency causes three different diseases which are essentially all resulting from vascular uh, abnormalities. Vitamin E, as we know, is an antioxidant. It scavenges free radicals um, that damage cellular membranes. And the disease associated with vitamin E deficiency in poultry is generally thought to be the result of a loss of protection by this important antioxidant uh, formation of hydroperoxides in the lipids and cellular membrane. And if this happens to endothelial cells, then you have increased vascular permeability, thrombosis, and ultimately tissue necrosis. And that's exactly what happens in the cerebellum of these particular birds. The other two conditions are exudative diesthesis and nutritional myopathy. The treatment of encephalopathy in birds would be to uh, feed an increased level of antioxidants or vitamin E. You have to throw some selenium in to deal with the, uh, uh, the exudative diesthesis, which is a vasculitis that affects a number of different organs. Uh, these animals will have uh, a subcutaneous edema fluid in the thorax, the abdomen, and the pericardium as well. The nutritional myopathy is treated by giving additional cysteine, and this uh, just shows up as white streaks within the skeletal muscles of the, uh, the breast or the legs. It's a classic lesion in turkeys and a very characteristic one for vitamin E. Polio and cephalomalacia. Not a great name for this disease, but certainly better than crazy chick disease. Here's an absolutely fantastic picture uh, from Jeff Saunders down at Virginia Tech um, of a lamb with severe degeneration of the developing brain as a result of copper deficiency. I should correct myself on this. This is a fetal lamb. The deficiency is really within the ewe. She's not getting enough copper. And so these animals have uh, deficient myelin production. 
copper is very important in a number of systems, including the production of myelin. You get severe hypomyelination to the point that this almost looks porencephalic. There is also dysmyelination. Copper deficiency is well known for causing myelination problems in ruminants, and we've talked about a couple of other uh, conditions in which you may see that, including bovine pestivirus. The mechanism is very different. Uh, the, the pestivirus, the BVD virus, affects many cells in the body, and if it affects uh, the oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells which produce myelin, obviously myelin is not going to be seen. Another condition um, and another fantastic picture, this one from Dr. Donald O'Toole, also demonstrates severe hypomyelinization. And if you look at the brain of this Solaire's calf, I never know how to pronounce that. Is it sailors or solaires? Um, but uh, sailors' calves have a, uh, a metabolic disease which is known as beta manosidosis. In addition to a number of skeletal issues, including uh, domed heads, uh, brachynathism, uh, these animals were generally recumbent with significant tremors, and you can see the tremendous lack of myelin in these particular animals. The corpus callosum is almost invisible. If you try to, to look for the differentiation between the gray and the white mare, you just can't see it because there is such little myelin in these particular animals. The lysosomal storage diseases or a group of diseases which all have one thing in common. Uh, these animals have a genetic lack of a particular enzyme. These deficiencies impair their ability to break down usually long-chain polysaccharides and there are saccharides and there are many different types of these. In manosidosis they're unable to break down N-linked glycoproteins, which accumulate in a wide range of cells in many organs. Uh, most commonly in lysosomal storage disorders, uh, they are seen uh, the vacuoles, which represent lysosomes, which are filled with this material that normally is broken down, but in these particular enzyme deficient animals can't be. Um, they're most often and most early seen in uh, cells that are phagocytic, like macrophages, as well as many cells of the mesenchymal lineage, like fibroblasts. In animals with uh, uh, manosidosis, they often have severe neuronal vacuolation. There's a, beta manosidosis is a genetic problem that is seen in uh, Celere cattle and uh, Nubian goats. Um, there's also an alpha manosidosis, and alpha manosidosis can be a, a genetic problem with a deficiency in uh, the expression of the gene product that makes that enzyme. Or it can also be an acquired problem as a result of ingestion of a number of plant species, including uh, stragulus, loco weed. Um, Swainsona or Oxytropis. So, great example of a lysosomal storage disorder. All the lysosomal storage disorders eventually affect the brain. And this is one that's very characteristic in the lack of myelination in these particular animals. Most of the lysosomal storage disorders don't cause any significant uh, gross lesions. The other one that will do that as a result of accumulation of a pigment is a disease that is seen in a number of species, uh, almost any species, and it's known as seroid lipofusinosis. Seroid lipofusinosis is seen in a number of breeds of dogs with a variety. There are up to 13 
uh, different genetic abnormalities in humans which result in the accumulation of this wear and tear pigment in, uh, in neurons. And about eight of them have been identified in various breeds of dogs. The accumulation of this pigment often imparts a dark brownish color as we see here to the brain of these dogs. These dogs um, are initially born normal and then over time in a period of uh, months to several years they will have progressive dullness, uh, seizure activity, um, and other neurologic signs which get progressively worse until they're put down. I'm always amazed at the discoloration that you can see in tissues that uh, have excessive levels of ceroid in the cells. Uh, when you look at these brains, you will see, and it's not difficult to, to see the, the accumulation of the brown granules of ceroid within the cytoplasm of the neurons, and then as the neurons die, uh, it will be taken up by phagocytic cells uh, glial cells and, and infiltrating macrophages uh, within the brain. But it never seems enough to cause a total discoloration. Same thing uh, is what you would see in a condition in dogs known as brown dog gut or intestinal uh, ceroidosis. Now, the ceroid accumulates in the smooth muscle of the, uh, uh, of the, of the muscular layers on either side of the nucleus but doesn't seem all that much but this is a great lesion and you'll see it in cases of ceroid lipofusinosis in many species this particular picture also from jeff saunders is from a tiger uh, i've been involved in elephant necropsy with uh, with something like that and i think we see it in a lot of uh, different species it's not something that you want to over diagnose remember uh, Neurons often accumulate a bit of uh, lipofusin over time. Lipofusin is a wear and tear pigment. Um, as the cellular membrane breaks down, uh, it is phagocytized in an autophagosome and it's broken down further, but lipid only goes so far. Eventually, it gets to a point where it can no longer be broken down anymore, and you have a phagolysosome, a secondary lysosome, which contains these brown granules of broken down fat, or lipofusin. Uh, most cells turn over at a rate that we don't notice it, but in cells like the neurons in the brain, which you keep for a lifetime, you will often see lipofusin granules, and you don't want to overdiagnose this, um, because if you look in the brain of any old animal, you're going to see some lipofusin. So make sure that the animal has uh, neurologic signs, and it's always best to see if you can prove that this is a genetic mutation. Uh, I think that uh, a number of uh, suspicious deaths in, in animals that never really came to a diagnosis have have had this label applied to them over the years because you just couldn't find anything else to uh, to explain the neurologic disease in an old animal. Okay, let's look at some toxicologic diseases uh, that affect various animal species. Here's a fantastic lesion in the dog, which, uh, sorry, excuse me, the horse, which has, uh, has, goes by the sort of difficult to process name nigropallidal encephalomalacia. It's due to ingestion of one of a number of plant species, including in the U.S., a yellow star thistle or Centuria solstitialis or Russian knapweed, a Centuria repens, which is sort of a, a weed that grows in the western part of the United States in dry pastures. The name nigropallidal encephalomalacia comes from the fact that you get bilaterally symmetrical hemorrhage and necrosis of the globus pallidus and the substantia 
nigra. Now it's very difficult to get both of them in the directly to the neurons and also damage to the endothelial cells with edema and ischemia uh, in these particular areas as well. Nigropallidal encephalomalacia due to yellow star thistle and Russian knapweed. I'm going to show you this because I missed this particular one the same time. This is the same lesion and you can see the outline uh, here in the globus pallidus. Um, we just don't have the hemorrhage that usually signifies necrosis. Here is one more classic toxic lesion that is seen in the horse and this is a wonderful picture taken by Dr. John King of uh, a toxicosis which has gone by the name of moldy corn poisoning for many years. The lesion is absolutely fantastic in picture in this picture. Uh, it also goes by the name leucoencephalomalacia. As we see here, the white matter is outlined by a ring of hemorrhage. There is breakdown of the myelin, giving it a yellow discoloration. You can even see some areas of cavitation within it. The condition is caused by the growth of a saprophytic fungus of grain, uh, often corn, but it can be other grains, which is known as Fusarium verticilloides. It used to be called Fusarium maniliformi, and this particular fungus produces uh, four different toxins, all of which collectively are called fumonisins. Uh, it produces A1, A2, and B1, and B2, and B1 is the most common, most toxic, and is the, considered the toxic principle for this particular condition. The toxin uh, inhibits a number of enzymes uh, which are required for sphingolipid biosynthesis. And there's an accumulation of sphingonine and sphingosine in the affected tissues which causes direct cellular toxicity to endothelium. This is a vascular lesion. It's not a direct toxicity to the myelin, but you have uh, damage to the endothelium, you have ischemia, and then ultimately damage to the cells within the white matter. And it's a wonderful, a wonderful lesion. Uh, in chronic cases, it can cause hepatotoxicity, which looks very much like aflatoxicosis. And in certain species, fumonisin will cause severe edema, including swine, which get hydrothorax. So, leucoencephalomalacia, a vascular lesion caused by fumonisin B1. I miss Fusarium maniliformi because that made a whole lot of sense and all the toxins were named after it, but they renamed that one, so it's Fusarium verticilloides. That's one I have trouble remembering. Okay, well, we've come to the end of this lecture. Um, there are probably a lot of other great lesions associated with metabolic, uh, nutritional, or toxic, but uh, these are the ones that I think are fantastic images. We're going to come back uh, with two more lectures after this. We're going to have a short one on miscellaneous diseases of the central nervous system, which didn't really fit into any of the other categories. And we're going to finish with uh, the neoplasms. We always do the last uh, lecture on the neoplasms of the various systems, and there are a bunch of good ones uh, for those of you who are interested in, uh, in brain tumors. Um, there is a marked revision underway in the diagnosis of uh, tumors of the brain in, in small animals, which I'm excited to talk about. I think some great work is being done here, which simplifies uh, our ability to diagnose these tumors, brings us a little more in line with human medication who have used a much simpler uh, system for a number of years now. So with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day. I hope you're enjoying fantastic health, and we'll see you next time.